Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel here. I am uh, sitting next to the charmed and wonderful and very knowledgeable Paul Wells. Drummer extraordinaire, musician extraordinaire, collector and audiophile extraordinaire. Paul has really big ears and has a lot of knowledge about all these records we all talk about. A lot of people just know a little bit about the records, but Paul knows a lot about the history of all the different musicians. That's really amazing. So we got together because we want to um, compare all these new uh, Blue Note tone poets against... Paul has an original stereo pressing of Blue Train. I there think it's it a is. second stereo, actually. Which is pretty friggin' amazing. But an early, early stereo pressing. Right, and then he has... One. Uh, and this is the uh, Analog Productions stereo uh, double 45 RPM um, that I think came out in the maybe late aughts, like 2008, 2009, maybe 2010, somewhere around there. Okay. They predate the Music Matters. Um, you know, by a few years. That's right. They were first, <laughs> and then of course I have the uh, the new complete masters. That's the stereo. That's right? the stereo, and here's the mono. And um, I also have the Music Matters mono pressing. And right off the bat, we noticed that the Music Matters scan looks a whole lot better than the Tone Poet scan. My it's more detailed, better light, more natural. Just you see more. My understanding with uh, Music Matters is that they actually had access to the negatives, the original negatives from the the uh, Francis Wolff well, you photography think... collection, and and they rescan the negatives. They did some sort of high res scan, and then kind of recreate the album covers. Mm. Um, and I I don't know what the Tone Poets method is, but it looks a little darker and a little less detailed. Yeah, on that you can actually see the white of Coltrane's eyes. You can't see them there. I mean, we're nitpicking, of course, but that's what we do. But this original, well, this early New York um, stereo pressing looks a little more like the Tone Poet, actually, to me. Oh, that's it's a little bit darker, a oh, little bit less funny. detailed. So maybe the Tone Poet is actually oh, closer right. to oh, the original I think vibe. You're probably I don't right. Can't I don't see know. His eyes. Um, yeah. I forgot to mention Paul uh, plays with Vince G down on the Nighthawks. And they have played on many. Uh, they play on Boardwalk Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, he did the the Irishman for uh, Martin Scorsese, and you said you're on the upcoming Scorsese movie. Yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon. We did some music for the soundtrack, and we're also going to appear on screen in uh, in the movie, which we filmed back in February. That's great. Vince Giordano is the bass player, and he plays like a period perfect bass. Yeah, yeah, an aluminum bass. It's like twenties music. Yeah, it's uh, mostly 1920s and early 30s jazz, early jazz. Um, we do a little bit of swing era music, but mostly pre-swing era jazz. Uh, so you also play with uh, Curtis Steiger, who I don't know a lot right. about, but you're always in the overseas with Curtis, who must be yeah. very popular in Europe. He is, yeah. Curtis is a fantastic singer and saxophone player. Um, he had some big pop hits uh, in the early 90s that um, <clears throat> were very, they were very popular here, but they were really, really huge in the UK. And um, those are sort of like pop, adult contemporary R&B kind of hits. But he grew up singing and playing jazz. So when his time as a pop star kind of ran its course, he went back to being a jazz player and we do jazz versions of those songs. And leave. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Ken. The Brain Trust is here. <laughs> okay, let's get on to listening to some records. So Paul just listened to the Tone Poet mono and then the Music Matters mono of Blue Train. What were your initial thoughts, Paul? Uh, they're very, very close. Um, it's important to point out uh, that your version of the Music Matters is not the SRX version. Um, there were two versions um, that Music Matters did. There's a non-SRX and then an SRX. Uh, so your version, and also the one that I own, I, I own a Music Matters mono blue train, and both of ours are non-SRX. -S so that out of the way, um, they are very close. Um, the Tone Poet is cut just slightly hotter. Um, barely noticeable, but, but a slight difference in volume. Um, and interestingly the the music matters has i felt like a little bit more detail particularly in the top end a little bit more separation of instruments um the um tone poet 
had a little bit more rumble in kind of the sub bass region um, and I noticed that in Philly Joe Jones's bass drum when um, I, I assume that Rudy maybe well certainly Rudy had one mic over the drums um, that's what we see in pictures from this era, from the Hackensack era, would be one. one oh, I forgot, mic. yeah, this is Hackensack. Yeah, 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 wow. this is Hackensack, 57. Wow. Um, he moved to uh, Englewood Cliffs in July of 59. Wow. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, is it 57 or 58? God, I should know that offhand, but it's 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 definitely Hackensack. Yeah, it's the living room studio. You know, it's funny, I was looking at uh, Sonny Clark, My Conception, it has a great photo of Sonny Clark, and everything was so tight at Hackensack you can see the symbol like yeah. you know less than a foot from Sonny Clark's head yes yes so the the, the in the <laughs> living room the pictures that I've seen um, against one wall of like the living rooms like this against one wall was the piano with the end of the piano here and the player the pianist would be would be sitting here and the drummer was right in a corner right next to him um, facing out, facing this way. So the piano is facing this way. The drummer is facing this way. So the drummer's hi hat and left hand symbol were right next to the piano player. You're right. The piano player would be playing with a symbol right at his. You just gauge this from looking at various photographs. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of published photographs where you can see the drums right next. Surprised to the piano. nobody's done like a crazy like overhead diagram of of the studio, the live room, and his thing. And they probably will. Yeah, Actually. yeah. I mean, somebody should. There is a great Rudy Van Gelder studio website uh, that you can check. Um, maybe we can do some research and you yeah. can flash the link. Right. Right yeah. here. I've, you can I've edit that, that place. in. Maybe. Yeah, amazing. that's a really, really great website that um, um, I believe a, a guy that I know, an audiophile, um, whose name I'm spacing on, sorry. Uh, helped put that together. Um, oh, uh, uh, Richard Kaplis. Oh, so it is, he's DG Mono. Yeah, DG Mono. Right, yeah, yeah, very, very knowledgeable. Really knowledgeable um, guy, definitely. Record collector, both about like you know minutia of record collecting, um, but he's done a lot of really great research on Rudy's studio and methods. And Richard also knows a lot about just the music. He's he's very in tune with the music as well. So getting back to the to um, Blue Train, uh, the the. Um, yeah, as I said, a little more high-end detail. Now, oh, so what I was going to say about the miking of the drums, um, there's definitely an overhead. I don't know, in, in the Hackensack era, I don't know whether Rudy had a mic on the bass drum, but the bass drum on Blue Train is pretty hot. I suspect Philly Joe was using a relatively large bass drum, I think probably a 22-inch bass drum. Really? Which, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, he often used bigger drums. No kidding. Um, yeah, and, and you know, 18-inch huh. bass drums didn't exist in those days. The 18s didn't really come into use until around 1960. Um, no kidding. So is he using an 8x12 and a 14x14 14 or something else? It's possible bigger. It's possible he was no. using a 9x13 and a 16x16. 16 16. I wonder if that was part of the reason his drums just spoke besides the way he played. I think it's his touch mostly yeah. because there are plenty of recordings of him playing what are, I believe, smaller drums and they sound just as huge. Wow. Yeah, his, his, his touch and his technique and his approach to hitting the drums was just perfect I mean, just, yeah, like, yeah like just you know enormously high level of, of, of playing uh, back to blue train um, so <laughs> I don't know if there was a mic on the bass drum but there's certain versions of blue train where the bass drum is a little more prominent something to do with maybe if they bring up in the mastering um, some you know sort of very low kind of stuff in the sub bass i don't know what frequencies we'd be talking about probably below 40 uh hertz um but um i felt like i heard the bass drum more it was there was more on of which that one on on the tone poet and on the on the music matters i didn't hear as much of that very low end in the bass drum, but um, in a way I actually felt that the kit was better balanced because of that. Um, there wasn't a particular drum that stood out. What about um, the uh, tonality of the horns to you, or the presence of the horns? They're very good on both. I hear a lot of energy and aggression from all three of the horn players. I hear um, during the, the, the first solo break where Curtis Fuller has his um, you know his his uh, his um, his uh, sort of eight bars or whatever it is of unaccompanied 
um, Curtis Fuller, you hear a lot of the breath and the spit in the mouthpiece, and that's present on both of them. Um, you know, you could very clearly distinguish each note. It would be very easy if you were a musician and you wanted to transcribe any of the solos, or even Philly Joe's comping, it would be, on either of these pressings, I think it would be very easy to do that, because everything that gets played is very, very clear. Um, I do think it might be easier to transcribe Philly Joe's playing on the Music Matters, because as I mentioned, there's a little bit more high-end um, detail and sort of crispness and, and, and very, very high-end punchiness in, in the treble. Uh, that you hear in the cymbals, the attack of the stick on the cymbals, and also the attack of the stick on the snare drum. It might be easier to, to hear those details in the music matters rather than the tone poet. But I think that some people would interpret that as maybe the tone poet being a, better, a bit better balanced um, as far as the EQ. Um, I don't have a preference, to be honest. Um, one thing that's really interesting about them is that uh, despite being mono, it's a very, very wide soundstage. And I think that has something to do with your system. But I noticed that playing, I listened to the Music Matters mono on my system last night, and I noticed the same thing. You're really, it doesn't feel like you're listening to a mono record. You know, you don't have that impression of like, this is here, this is here, you know, one instrument's here, one instrument's there. But you also don't get this feeling that everything's kind of small in the middle. It's a very big sort of... That's what good mono sound. does. It creates its own layers and depth. Yeah, it's absolutely. And that's not... Illusion. Yeah, and that's not, you know, that a good system will, will present it that way, but it also is a good you know mastering i think because i've heard mono records that sound very contained right in the center and and um that can be good actually for making sure the balance of your system is good between Definitely. the left and right speakers but um this this really still has a very wide sound stage even though it's the same from one end to the other um if you're if you're not i say as buying advice if you're not normally a mono person um, I would still consider this. I wouldn't be afraid of it because it's mono. It's it's not going to feel closed in or, you know, anything like that. You still very much feel like it just it just sounds very real to me. <laughs> this is like he said she said, but it's more like he said he said. <laughs> yeah. And it, whatever that was really bizarre. Um, the the. The music matters definitely has more bass top to bottom and it has more rumble on the low end but i could follow the bass line throughout the whole thing whether he was up high or low when it got low to me it rumbled and it also sounded a little more distant in a way um but it, and it also sounded airier in a way and i think that maybe the music matters sounds more like probably what the original mono pressing sounded like so i've heard those those pressings at the store and they're uh they sound like that, a little more distant. I thought the tone poet was more immediate, more upfront. Tone poets are always more upfront for some reason, and a little more visceral. It's like there was more mid-range happening on the. I mean, these are all very slight, tiny gradations. They, they are pretty close. They're really, really close. You know, the big picture is that they're close. In a way, they're really close, and in a way, they're sort of not. I think I kind of preferred the tone poet. It seemed to be just more immediate and visceral. And seem to have a little more oomph for something, but the tone, but the music matters. I think sounds probably like the original mono sounds. But you weren't hearing what I was hearing. Where I was hearing some more detail in the top end, in the very top end, the crispiness of the cymbals in the music matters that I didn't hear in the tone poet. I definitely heard more air in the music matters. There seemed to be more of a di diaphanous, airy thing, and you could really hear that in the trumpet. And it seemed to give the piano solo a little more clarity. It's weird because you figure they're the same. It's the same tape unless unless they're using a second tape. You know the second machine tape because Rudy ran a second machine. So I wonder if they both use the same tape. It's those things you can never know. Well, no, no, no. This is there was a mono machine and a stereo machine in that era, oh. and he ran both. So this came. You know, both of them come from the mono tape. So then it's it's down to and this is what I've always thought. Music matters pressings. People are making different mastering decisions. Yeah. Joe Harley and Kevin Gray versus what was well different different producer yeah different producer yeah so so the music matters normally would have been Joe Harley and um, Rob 
Rombach is his, is his, is I that believe so. Yeah, I and mean, he but was with, Music Matters. Yeah, with Kevin Gray mastering. Now, so it's but apparently, now this is not. I, I'm pretty sure if you look at the Dead Wax in the Music Matters, normally they have um, Kevin. They have a uh, Joe Harley and Kevin Gray's initials in them, huh. but the Music Matters. Blue Train and only the Blue Train for some reason I believe only has Rob Rombach and Kevin Gray's initials. We can double check that. Well, that, to me that must be the difference overall between all music matters and all tone posts because you have a different producer. Ron Rombach wants to hear something different, and I it think, might be, you know, a, a small difference that Joe Harley wants that doesn't want to hear wants to hear something different. So, but because it's the same, it's all, otherwise, technically, it's all uh, Kevin Gray, right? It's all Kevin Gray, although there was some changes in equipment. Kevin Gray, you know, upgraded some things in his uh. signal chain. Um, but, but Joe Harley is the common denominator and Kevin Gray. But yeah, Rob Rombach being involved with Music Matters. I think he made different little calls. Absolutely, probably did, yeah. Because that's probably some things that he wanted to hear. And maybe him and Joe came to a compromise on how they were going to do those. But I believe that tone poets are basically just Joe's vision. Right. I mean, and there definitely are differences. <clears throat> I mean, they're actually, I was kind of surprised in a way how different they sound. But I, I think the music matters is probably similar to more of a real old school blue note mono pressing. Well, Rob is, well, but Kevin and Rob, or sorry, um, Joe and Rob are both big time collectors. They've been collectors of Blue Note records for their whole lives. Mm -hmm. And I believe they both have, you know, a more or less complete collection. I know Joe every, does. He's every yeah, Blue Note. He pulled them out when I interviewed him. And yeah, which is amazing. And uh but maybe Rob is a little more of an old school collector and maybe is more into like, you know, he maybe he has all the monos, original monos, mm -hmm. and maybe and, that's closer and, to what he wants to do. Different hear. ears. Yeah. You know, and they uh because when I interviewed Joe Harley, you know, he um, he pulled out a few, and he's got he's got a very high end system at home. He's got a crazy turntable. Oh I, yeah. I don't know what Ron Robbeck has, but Joe has a super duper crazy Joe, expensive system. And Joe has some nice uh, Vandersteen uh, Model Sevens, I right. believe, very high end Vandersteens and Audio Research. There's a, there's a an interview or two with Joe where he talks about his system. And, and he's definitely got a seriously great system. He does. I'd be curious own. to know what Ron Rombach had. Anyway, that mm -hmm. was really fascinating. So now we will continue to the uh, stereo versions. All right. What should we start with? Because now we have the uh, we have the 45 AP, am I right? Yeah. And we have the new Tone Poet. And, and we have your stereo pressing from what era? Uh, early 60s. I think we should listen to that first. All right. And we'll start out with Paul listening to that. So, Paul, I can tell right away from when we dropped the needle um, on on your stereo pressing, and then we played the AP, and then the new tone poet. I could tell you were uh, you had definitive opinions about each one. <laughs> I could tell right well, away. Well, I will say they're all very good. They're really all great, and you know, none, none of them. None of them ruin the music, certainly. These are not 75th anniversary pressings that no, everybody seems is, to complain about. Yeah, so much. this is not, the, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're, we're, this is an embarrassment of riches here to have these, to have these options. So, um, my early stereo, so this is a, um, this is a, this is one of those funny pressings where they use different labels on, on each side. So the, the side one is a, um, New York, New York label. And, you, and this is a P pressing? Yes, yes. Oh, there's a, doing that. there's a P on both sides. Uh, sorry, that was side two. Uh, sorry, side, side one, New York pressing. Side two, New York label. Side two has the 47 West 63rd Street label, which is the previous label. Um, so, you know, we go by the, the latest label, the last label, the most recent, which is the New York which I believe starts in 60 or 61 is when they started using that. Wow. It has the uh, Plastolite P. Um, it has, uh, where is it? It should have an RVG stereo. Um, yeah, RVG stereo and the Dead Wax. So it's basically an early 60s pressing. Um, 
and mine is a little beat up it's not the cleanest copy um i got it at bruised apple records up in peakskill which can oh, yeah. a, a great record store that can sure hit is. me too ken did a, a great video on them um, very cool store yeah so it's an early stereo and um it sounds like you know a vintage a vintage blue note it's got um you know eq wise it's a little hotter in the mid-range and upper mid-range um the bass is a little bit rolled off towards the low end but the bass that's there is really good really nice and punchy kind of in the mid bass um rudy was known for apparently um pumping up the mid bass a bit and it, it definitely has that sound so the bass is nice and defined and punchy um and uh i found that the the high end is a little I don't want to say rolled off. It doesn't sound dull or anything on like your that. Pressing. On, on your pressing. On this New York pressing, yeah. But it's got a little less crispness um, and super high-end detail than the modern pressings. But I rather like it. I find it sounds very natural. It sounds, to me... I mean, I hear these things particularly in the cymbals. I'm always, as a drummer, I'm always listening for the cymbals. I'm always listening to what the drummer is doing on the cymbals and the tonality of the cymbals. And in a way, this sounds a little more like if I was sitting in a club hearing a band play and what the cymbals are going to sound like to me. Because you have to figure in, when that was cut, the tape was very new the in relative terms. New, yeah. It wasn't 60 years old and something no. happens to tapes. I don't care what anybody said, but after 60 years, it's tape, it's oxide. Mm -hmm. Things are going to change. Things are going to maybe not degrade, but they're definitely going to be not as strong as they were when the record was first pressed. Yeah, potentially. And that was probably yeah. pressed from a very early... Uh, master yeah well you know he i don't know exactly the history of when the um generally when they would come out with a mono they would they would release the mono version first mm -hmm. um and they did that i think well into the 60s i i, I think again our, our buddy dj um uh, uh i'm sorry deep deep groove mono dg mono has more Richard info Kappos. on that yeah. yeah where where um they would release um, and I think actually London Jazz Collector has done research into this too, where they would release uh, the mono first and then maybe six months later they would release the stereo. But I think in the 50s, it was maybe even a year later. So this might be a second pressing. I don't wow. know, but it's an early pressing. And, it, and it, it was definitely, you know, the stereo tape was very fresh when Rudy did this master. I hear definitely some differences in, um, in EQ and kind of mastering style. But these are actually, I think, pretty similar wow. um, in a lot of ways. They have, the AP has that same kind of high mid-range bite, wow. that Rudy Van Gelder bite that you get from these, these earlier pressings. Um, but this has some more information in the super high end and also some more information in the super low end. Hmm. Um, but it's also a very, very nice sounding pressing. The, the, the Tone Poet, um, which is 33 RPM, um, is again more similar to, you know, it's, it's sort of like this is a thing, the AP is similar but sort of adds more. And then the Tone Poet has a lot of what the AP has, but it's getting a little bit back towards, there's a, a less of that sort of um, exciting mid-range. Um, there's a little less of that happening. These are sort of, I think, more evenly balanced EQ-wise. I thought this was a fantastic sounding pressing. And I think that if I had to pick one of them, and I wasn't thinking about the extra collectability of the early pressing or whatever if it was just purely sound i think i might go with this one compared to the monos as even well. compared to the monos I, I yeah, I, question, I, yeah i like the stereo spread of this a lot it's um you know it's the horns are on um let me think the horns are on, coming out of the left speaker piano's kind of centered bass and drums are coming out of the right speaker but they're not panned very hard it seems um and I just I don't know I guess for me as again as a, as a musician and specifically as a drummer having the drums a bit isolated in the right channel um, I like being able to hear a little more I guess you get more separation of the instruments um, because they're not you know all sort of in the same 
uh, um, part of the sound stage, and I can hear a little more detail and a little more. I mean, the drums are just a little more isolated, so you just hear the, the you hear them in isolation a little bit more, and I can pick out things that Philly Joe's doing a little more specifically. But maybe if I wasn't a musician, I would like the the, the mono presentation, and then it would be it would be hard to pick between the the two between the tone poem and the music matters they're both really excellent both of the mottos sound really good yeah yeah i mean they're just like there's no loss of detail and most people like mono when they like mono because they think it has more force has more low end and i definitely thought the music matters had more low end overall had mm. more bass top to bottom it definitely had that force thing happening but um but go ahead yeah i mean this doesn't lack it though this has a lot of energy they all all three of these stereo versions have a lot of energy um, but this is probably a better EQ balance. Um, the, the, the extra bit of mid-range that the original, or not the original, but the early stereo has, um, definitely gives it some excitement, um, and some bite. But, but I think the excitement and bite is in this one, too. It's funny, don't they, uh, Joe Harley has said they don't want to repeat any of the Music Matters pressings mm -hmm. for Tone Poets, but they just did, didn't they? They did. This is the one time they because everything is... else has come out as the classics, right. which is sort of overseen by uh, Jem Karosman, the publicist at Blue Note, and they're pressed at a different place. The Tone Poets are RTI? One I is RTI so, and one yeah. is the other. Yeah, I think they're RTI. <sighs> so yeah. for this, they did it. So in, in this instance, you know, you know he probably, Kevin Gary probably has all these pressings so he's learned you know just his muscle memory i guess to a degree he knows what he wants to get because he did all the tone all the music matters even though they're doing when, different ones it's still blue notes the same tapes joe has uh, said some things interesting um in interviews where he said that they know it's not so much specific to records but actually certain eras like they know that like okay 1958 in Hackensack is going to sound a certain way. Totally. 1957 in Hackensack is going to sound a different way. You know, and then move to Englewood Cliffs in July of 59. So early Englewood Cliffs, like the rest of 59 or in the, into 60, is going to be a certain type of thing. It's a certain sound, and they have to do certain things to those tapes to make them sound good, releasable. Whereas, you know, maybe 1961, 1962 is a different sort of sound. Like maybe Rudy was upgrading his gear maybe he got different preamps Plus the and experiment or all the time. yeah right right or the mic placement is a little different so they know that certain eras okay this is going to have a lot of this and we need to do this right. to fix that this is going to have a lot of something else yeah, i think some rudy records some of them are failures some of them sound so weird like you know when the drums start um he doesn't have the mics loud enough so the cymbals start going whoosh, whoosh, phasing really crazy isn't that because yeah. the mics aren't loud enough it could be or it could be that the the he's using stereo mics or he's using you know two mics that like in the in the 60s at some point in the 60s he started putting two mics on the drums right um and maybe they were out of phase or something like that just some things um, are so weird like even on, like on the red well, garland records on prestige sometimes the piano is the worst sounding thing on the record yeah. and this was one where rudy hit everything just right maybe because yeah. it was coltrane i don't know Rudy in interviews said, I don't have a sound. The record labels have a sound. There I do go. what they want to do. There you go. And, and, and it's true. I mean, he was doing Savoy in the 50s, and Savoy in 56, 57 sound different than Blue Note in 56, 57. They're very different to me. Yeah, they are. And you know, they're, they're and they're Prestige more, is different. I, I think the Savoys are sort of washed out sounding. There aren't specific, I and mean, they're all mono, but it's sort of a, a big, loose kind of mono sound. Mm. I really like them. I, I, I find them to be pretty... Uh, I think they're a bit warmer. Yeah. Um, but maybe a little looser, maybe a little sort of fluffier or something, too. Right. I don't know. But I have some really great sounding ones. I wonder but, if he did a bunch of Savoys at Hackensack. Well, this, yeah, the Savoys were all done in, in the Hackensack right. era. Wow. Yeah, that's all Hackensack era. So. Cool. Cool. All right, should we... Uh, you want to check these out? I will. Paul, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Glad to, man. Your opinion is always uh, revelatory, and it's great to have you up here. Oh, thank you, Ken. And, great um, to be here. Thanks for having me. And I am paying off Paul with records and amplifiers. <laughs>
as you pointed out and I agreed the drums sound really natural they're not it's, it's not an audiophile pressing you don't hear every little bit of detail from all the instruments the piano is really buried but it sounds it sounded really natural and easy to listen to I mean it sort of sound like you know all mid-range blasting out of a car stereo from the 60s but it also sounded really natural especially when we put on the AP 45 which I just did not like I mm -hmm. thought it sounded really thin in in the in the upper mids it just didn't sound natural at all um, and then we played the tempo and at first I didn't like that at all either but you, but then you hear all that detail and there's a lot of lushness you hear all the detail in the drums which is really nice but there's also compared to your stereo pressing and the mono both both those monos it just sounded kind of tilted up mm. in the treble um, so I think I prefer the either one of those monos, you know, because the the stereo blue train, the new tempo is an audiophile pressing. You hear every little, all the minutia, the detail. You hear every little thing. Um, like you said on Lee's solo, you hear the air behind the note. Yeah. And it's really clean and pure sounding. The bass is pure. You hear all the little micro detail of the drums and him switching and all his almost his thought patterns. The solo sounded really beautiful. But it didn't sound as natural as the mono pressings to me for some reason. Mm. I don't know. That's pretty fast. And granted, we've listened to like six pressings, so my ears <laughs> might be a little weird. Well, you you mentioned um, at one point when, before we started, I think you you said that uh, uh, the stereo tone poet you thought sounded fantastic. You would listen to it a day or two ago, and you felt that it Just was knocked the best me out because it had it had all things which I think are missing in a lot of pump, tone poets, which is the sound of the studio. Mm -hmm. And we were talking off camera that this is the only tone poet of which they've also done the music matters, which yeah. they said they'd never do. Right. So, um, and it is different than it really you know, is even different. The, the mono tone poet is different than the mono music matters, even though they were both done, uh, at, you know, by Kevin Gray. Um, although we don't know how much input Joe Harley may or may not have had in the Music Matters because I think his name is not in the dead wax for some reason. Right. But but that's that speculation. Maybe he someday can give us more insight into that. But they, in my, are, they are different for sure. And my Music Matters is a mono, so we don't have like a Music Matters stereo. It never they never came out. They never. only did a mono. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the AP is the only reference. And um, I. I really didn't like the AP, but like, but the tone poet has a lot of good things about it. But still, I think I prefer the mono because it just really sounds natural. And your early stereo pressing, even mm. though it's not an audiophile pressing, also sounds really natural. Yeah. Like you said, the drums sound, the cymbals sound like cymbals. On um, the AP and a little less so on the tone poet, the cymbals sound like little tiny cymbals. Yeah, there's <laughs> like just a toy a, drum set. Yeah, yeah, they seem to they they. It's almost like they sound higher pitched. It's and really strange. Um, and smaller somehow or something like that. It's it is it is strange. I don't know if it's something that Rudy did in the EQ that he um, EQ'd some sounds out that he didn't like that he didn't feel were necessary or something. I don't really know. Or maybe it's just something to do with the pressing. Maybe maybe some of the surface noise is covering that stuff up because my mm. early stereo is not the cleanest copy in the world. It's it's a bit noisy, you know, right? For sure. Although the music tends to to cover it up, um, there is noise there. So dynamic. But um, but all in all, I mean, we're lucky to have all these pressings. Yeah. I mean, these are uh, first world white people problems, we're, you know. So it's uh, an we're, embarrassment of riches. Yeah, here. I mean, we're lucky to have all this. But I think you would hear all these same differences on a less crazy hi-fi system. You'd still hear these differences because your ears would be adjusted to your system. And I bet if we played all these records on somebody's, if they had a Rega P1 and a, some sort of a lower entry shit amp, and maybe some. Uh, Clips, you know, or RPM six hundreds or, or Warfdales, yeah. which are great speakers. I think they would hear all these same differences. I it agree. Would all be my, relative. My system is not as high end as yours, uh, and and I was hearing these differences between my early stereo and the and the um, Music Matters mono that I own. Um, I heard a lot of the same differences that we heard. And it's a lot really of the same bizarre how sort of different everything. Not to interrupt you, but how different at all that each one is. Yeah, it's really, it's re they're really different. And maybe that's the thing. Maybe maybe you do on a system like yours, you know. And I should point out, too, I want to mention that Ken's system, in case anybody's wondering, 
sounds absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Ken has really developed a fantastic sounding system, and anybody who reads his reviews in Stereophile can be very confident that uh, that Ken is um, auditioning all of this stuff and reviewing on all this stuff with an extremely good sounding system. Yeah, and we did all this on my Shindos, which I don't get to listen to enough because I'm always having to review something else that doesn't relate to the different, Shindos. Different amps, But right? still, the Shindos always just sound better than anything, and I have... I have Parasound amps here. I have Pass Labs amps. I have Air A Y R E amps. Nothing sounds like the Shindos. Nothing. Not even fucking close. Yeah. You know, and my just nothing does. I don't I really. I don't quite even understand it. Um, but Ken Shindo was just really, really brilliant. Um, well, thanks for watching this. This is a lot of video, a lot of information. Paul, thanks so much for bringing your pressings and your uh, happy to your immense knowledge. Happy to, man. And I'm speaking from the left side of the couch, and thanks for watching. <laughs> okay.